Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 5th, 2017, and my guests are Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Helen's an exile from the humanities with research interests in late medieval, early modern religious writing for and about women. James has a doctorate in math and a background in physics. He's the author of four books. His latest is Life in Light of Death. Our topic for today is an essay they have written. The title is A Manifesto Against the Enemies of Modernity which uh, we'll put a link up to uh, with this episode. And it's quite long. Uh, I found it to be worth the read. Uh, It's extremely provocative, and it's a very interesting take on uh, ideology, politics, daily life, uh, and in particular the current situation uh, around the world and in the political realm and the nature of discourse. So our topic today is going to be that essay, uh, which focuses on what you call modernity. Helen, let's start with you. What do you mean by modernity? Well, I think we used that term because it is so general, because there is obviously there is the scientific revolution, there's the enlightenment, but to sort of pick on one of those things and, and describe it as the, the, call, the catalyst of a great change it is too simplistic, really, over 500 years, taking in a number of factors from the Reformation through um, you know, the age of reason, the scientific revolution and, and various other developments at that time, things gradually changed. We'd gradually moved from an epistemology of faith and narratives to one in which science and reason um, came to dominate. So modernity is the much more sort of overarching description for that period of change. James, what what would you like to add? Um, from my perspective, we use the term modernity to sidestep saying enlightenment liberalism, which would be a kind of liberalism in the Jeffersonian or Millian sense, because that term has become politically charged, especially in the U.S. Liberalism is seen as the enemy of conservatism, which is sort of one of the big themes of the essay. So I'm going to read a list that, that you made in the uh, in the essay to summarize uh, modernity, which reinforces what you both just said. Uh, a profound respect for the power of reason and the unity and strength of science, an unwavering commitment to the norms of secular democratic republics, including rule of law, and an abiding belief that they are the most beneficent political force the world has known, a keen understanding that whatever and however group dynamics may influence human societies, the atomic unit of society to be defended and cherished is the individual, an earnest appreciation that the good is best achieved through a balance between human cooperation and competition, brokered and mediated through the interplay of institutions that work on behalf of public and private interests. Um, on the surface, those seem all undeniable. Who would who would be against those, Helen? Who's who's against that? On the surface, most people claim not to be against them. Some of the more extreme postmodernists will tell us that this is all a white supremacist patriarchal system. But for the most part, people are sort of tac- tacitly in support. However, a lot of the things that are coming out. Of their um, of, of their discourse at the moment are are explicitly against the against individuality. Primarily, there's an awful lot of um, collectivism and group identity politics going on on in both extremes at the moment. Well, let's start. And, let's um, start with the postmoderns. What's their main critique of what you're calling modernity, and uh, why are they so opposed to modernity? Well, they see that as as the time of Western um, domination, and um, and there, there's a lot of of truth in that because yes, slavery and colonialism did take place within this time. They tend to see the West as 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 the ultimate evil at the moment because the discourse because they're talking about discourses of power. They're very um, 
Foucauldian, where reality is constructed by systems of power and the West has dominated, it, they want to, a kind of reversal and to bring out these sort of alternative ways of knowing and these suppressed voices, which could be women or it could be uh, previously colonised countries or other kinds of minorities. And this um, leads sort of necessarily to condemning condemning modernity, condemning enlightenment, liberalism, condemning um, even the sort of, even democracy, really. Everything is culturally constructed in a way to give um, white Westerners power. So they're very sceptical of it. I mean, it's quite common to hear the myth of enlightenment progress and um, modernity, the modern project has failed because they see it as, as having having failed on this ethical pluralist level. Well, it's, yeah, it's not just um, white Westerners, it's white male Westerners, right? It's, yes. it's the, the oppressed groups are, it's a long list, we won't list them here, but there's a group of oppressed folks and they've been oppressed by the, the white male Westerners and but there's also a philosophical viewpoint underlying the postmodern critique of modernity, which mm. is their version of truth. How do you see – how does that play into the, the political perspective that they bring? Well, because they see um, knowledge as a construct of power, obviously the uh, science and reason are the way that white male Westerners have constructed Knowledge. So the reaction to that is to try to break down these boundaries and bring up other ways of knowing, which are often cultural narratives, which are lived experience um, of minority groups. I mean, some, it's even been suggested, you know, witchcraft and um, other form, of all kinds of epistemologies, and, and including faiths of, of people of marginalised groups, not uh, white Western Christians, obviously, but other other faith groups. And this is the, the form of sort of pluralism that postmodernism is in favour of. Nothing is objectively true, but everybody has their own truths because white Westerners have dominated with their truth in the past. This must now be subordinated to the truths of marginalised groups. So that comes down very much against objective truth in any form and against reason, against science. Yeah, it, uh, it reminds me of um, the enemy of the, my enemy is my friend. So anything that's anti-Western colonial uh, intellectual enlightenment, uh, like witchcraft, must be good, uh, which has yeah. a strange perspective. But uh, this this episode is not strictly about postmodernism, and perhaps we'll have a postmodern voice on this program at some point to defend it. Um, but let's turn to the pre-moderns. And James, what's what's the pre-modern critique of modernity and uh, what's wrong with it? So ultimately, I think the pre-modern critique uh, of modernity, so pre-modernism, I should say, is sort of the far right, so very conservative take on how the modern project is failing. So it's rooted often in, in religion It's or the the collective experience of the, the common sense, every man is how we worded it in the essay. And so it seems to be that their critique is largely based in a lack of trust for modern systems and institutions rather than feeling like the power dynamics have oppressed various groups that need to be brought back to power, like, or to, to be need to be forwarded like the postmodernists see the pre-modernists see that the questions have really been settled. We had kind of a golden era at some point in the past, and it's up to certain types of, I guess, extremely conservative thinking or paleoconservative thinking, really, in order to try to defend Western values and preserve what is so that we can maintain and keep that golden era. So it's kind of an attempt to... Uh, situate, if you want to use a postmodern word, um, the focus of power in the traditional everyman, as the, so the, the dominant groups historically are under uh, the, the project of modernity. And so their, their primary concern is that traditional values in particular are going to slip away under the progressive project or that we will erect 
economic institutions. It'll lead to ruin and so on. So that's the primary concern from the from the pre-modern side, as far as I can tell. And I'm not a pre-modernist and so have a little bit of difficulty understanding their worldview. I just happen to live with a lot of them or around a lot of them <laughs> living in the southeast U.S. Yeah, you are in uh, Tennessee. Is that correct? I am in Tennessee. The and, county I live in is extraordinarily conservative. And Helen, so, where, where do you live? I'm just outside East London. So this is a very international episode. I, I really like that. I'm in the uh, the center of the United States power nexus in Washington, D.C. You're lost, uh, James, in the backwoods of Tennessee, and uh, Helen's the cosmopolitan Londoner. Uh, yeah. I want to go back to you, James. Uh, you're critical of Hayek in your essay. What do you see as Hayek's failing? Well, Hayek was, and, and Helen will actually have more to say about Hayek than I will, but Hayek was, was thoroughly modern through and through. And it's a shame we didn't have space to devote a little bit more, uh, a little bit more discussion to, to his position because we came off a little, a little unfair, I suppose, to him. But we, we've oversimplified it. And it's not so much Hayek who did have some concerns ultimately about the application of over-rationalized knowledge or even um, rationalism on some level. It, it's more the way that the pre-modern people have taken Hayek and championed him as this kind of, um, you know, ultra free market sort of philosophical champion. And so that's that, that that's more what we were speaking to. And like I said, it's, it's unfortunate we didn't have more space to give. But as you noted, the essay is already over 9000 words. It's an extremely long read. And adding more depth there, we initially did and ended up taking it out because it was just a little bit too much. But Helen may have actually some more things to say about Hayek than I do. She's a little bit more philosophically grounded. Helen, do you want to add anything? I, I think with, with – because as, as James pointed out, but the criticism that we've had most on that essay, I mean from the people who – we, who's thinking we respect, who don't just want to call us um, far right or far left loons, we're both apparently, has <laughs> been in the rather summary way that we've dealt with Hayek. And I, what I've found with him is that the most reasonable thinkers can take him and do take him as a warning against overconfident or naive trust in expertise or rationalism, as a reminder of the importance of fallibilism and of local knowledge. And that's great, but it's similar in a way to postmodernism, where the most reasonable of those will remind us of our biases, remind us of our cultural influences and warn against being too certain of anything. And we are all for not being too certain of anything. But when we get a lot of the because we obviously we're both quite active on on Twitter and social media and, and we get a lot of answers to our essays as well. When we get really extreme libertarians who are fundamentally opposed to expertise in every form and just simply don't think that there can be expert knowledge and a really foregrounding traditionalist and their own sort of um, narratives, often religious, but not always, then we do find that they're using Hayek quite a lot as a justification for doing this. So he may not have approved of that at all, but that, that is what tends to come across. Yeah, that's life. Um, uh, now, so I'm going to try to defend the Hayekian perspective for a minute here, and I concede that you, you've conceded that you may have been too critical. But at one point you write in the essay, liberty and individuality are cornerstone values of modernity. So I, that's, I would argue that liberty and, interval, and individuality are the cornerstones of my worldview. So mm -hmm. why aren't you just plain old classical liberals? Um whether you're Hayekian or Smithian or Millian or whatever uh, in Ian you want to be, um, why don't – since you are big fans, each of you, of liberty and individuality, what bothers you about the libertarian or classical liberal project that you think is anti-modern? I guess that's the right way to say it. Helen? I, I'm, I'm not – I mean in my um – 
in my bio in my biography on Twitter, I have used the word classical liberal to describe myself. I've tended to come away from that now and say universal liberal or enlightenment liberal because I've been misunderstood to have yeah. um, libertarian economics and I don't actually have a comprehensive economic position. I am in favour of, an, of a, a mixed economy and it's not at all my area of expertise. So I don't have a problem with the libertarians who fall within the classical liberal tradition culturally, who don't oppose science or reason and who don't um, deny expertise in all forms. And very many of them don't. I mean, here in um, England, which um, sometimes is confusing to Americans, a lot of our libertarians are leftists. Mm -hmm. And so they fall quite close to the centre-left liberal position, except that they tend to be in favour of Brexit, whereas the liberals tend not to be. So it all gets quite sort of melded in the middle. But if you ask me, do I have a problem with classical liberalism? I, I certainly don't. They can, some classical liberals have expressed opinions that I don't agree with because they come for more further right than I do. So let me let me talk about my own views for a second, and then, James, you can react to it. You know, I see myself as a classical liberal, but is each time that you talk about science, uh, I get a little uneasy because I think the modern project, the part, the part, of, part of modernity that I'm uncomfortable with in 2017, is probably the over reliance on science and the overconfidence in our ability to understand the complexity of the world. It's a very Hayekian view. You you mentioned it earlier, James. I think and said it very well. Um, so I consider myself. Um, well, except for the fact that I'm religious. I'm a religious Jew, which is kind of tricky. For So in that sense, I'm a, definitely a pre-modern. Um, but I don't use that in any of my political um, – I don't think I use it in my political uh, viewpoint. I'm very um, uh, liberal socially, it's left to the left socially in American politics, very much a libertarian there on drugs, gay marriage, etc. So I'm curious, James, if – if you have a, a bone to pick with any of that, is there – in your feeling about you know, putting aside my personal religious views, which I know you're not, not – is not your thing, the, but as a political animal, my version of classical liberalism and my muted respect for science, if I, if I, am I an anti-modern? Um, well, I don't know enough about you to qualify you as an anti-modern. But I mean, because I think that's actually the way we use it, a fairly serious charge to be an anti-modern. <laughs> I think you really actually have to be on the lunatic fringe left or right. We don't mean to lump in, you know, religious people or mainline, roughly mainline libertarians or any of these kinds of, of, of worldviews. So I doubt that you're anti-modern. Uh, I do have a little, I guess, concern about your your skepticism of science, but science should have skepticism built into it. So that's um, not an unreasonable position, nor is it even anti-scientific. I think that we have kind of a situation where we have two modes of human cognition and experience going on at once, and the individual liberty side of what's often billed classical liberalism, while it's incredibly important and cornerstone to modernity and modern values and freedom and liberty and successful economic systems and all of this. At the same time, we also are, are very social animals and groupishness is part of us. And I think that the full out classical liberal technology, if you will, from, you know, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries wasn't aware of the depth of moral psychology and moral sociology and the way that those actually interplay in human dynamics. And so I feel like there needs to be a little bit more understanding of, not necessarily embracing of, the concept of group dynamics as well as individual liberty. So that's not to say that I'm in any way a collectivist. I think it's more along the lines of, like we said in the essay, that the atom of the uh, modern society is the individual. But if you look at how molecules are created, we often hear from the right that the family becomes 
you know, the fundamental unit of society. I don't even think that's right. I think it's the social networks that we create around ourselves a little bit bigger than the family become the, the fundamental unit of society. But those social networks have strong moral, uh, moral norms, moral, uh, moral behavior, moral, I keep using the word moral, I'm sorry. So they have strong moral norms and they have uh, tendencies to become naturally and not necessarily the negative ways we usually say tribal. And those have to be recognized in a way that even, you know, something very advanced like million utilitarianism can't quite capture. Uh, An excellent book I've read on this topic is Joshua Green's Moral Tribes, which says that we need to, for kind of everyday purposes, use kind of our moral intuition side of thinking, which is going to be more tribal and groupish. But then when we need to sort out problems between groups of individuals, whether it's libertarians and liberals or conservatives and liberals or uh, Jews and Christians or whoever it happens to be, we need to then slip into a metamoral mode that's based on Mill's utilitarianism. And I think that that's actually right, that we actually have to take in both sides at the same time. And I feel personally that classical liberalism as a political philosophy hasn't had the opportunity to address that as fully as it needs to be. So that's my reservation with classical liberalism I think that's on it. that end. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, the rest was just to say that I, like Helen, agree that a blended economy and a regulated capitalism is required in order to create an effective economic system. So I'm a little bit skeptical of, especially, you know, where I live, Southeast, majority of people calling themselves libertarians. I've finally realized that I live in a bubble in this regard, but the majority of them strongly align with uh, Randian objectivism, which I think is a little bit extreme as far as the, the individual factor goes. And so I can't really get on with Ayn Rand's, um, vision and its influences on libertarianism. So I'm a little skewed in my view. I didn't realize that until recently because I thought I lived in libertarian Mecca, <laughs> but apparently it's kind of crazy libertarian Mecca. Well, it's one flavor. We, you know, we had, uh, we had Jennifer Burns on recently to, who wrote a, a very thoughtful biography of Ayn Rand, which I recommend that episode to listeners and her book. And we also had Josh Green on talking about that book as well. And that was very uh, interesting. He's much more of a utilitarian than I am, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a provocative viewpoint, an interesting viewpoint. Let's talk for a minute about tribalism though, because I think you raise a great point about uh, dynamics and, and groupthink and what is good and bad about groupthink, the way norms emerge and it is usually is often sometimes at least a good thing, uh, but it can be a bad thing. You can have norms, so we've talked on the program before about uh, – that are racist um, or sexist. But the, the, the point that you make that classical liberalism hasn't really grappled with that I think is a fair critique. So I want to get your perspective on tribalism generally because – and we'll use that as a segue to, to later on talk about the current state of the world, which I find increasingly tribal or at least feels that way. So what's – Let's talk about tribalism and why it seems to be rearing its head now um, and and seems to be, along with partisanship, which you do write about in, in some detail, what's going on there? Uh, what is – how should we think about tribalism and partisanship in a world where you want science to, to triumph? One of you said – both of you, I think, mentioned the word narrative as part of our uh, pre-modern nature – and I think narrative remains the essential human way of understanding the world. It's, of course, terribly flawed. And when it's supported by science, it's less flawed. But we tell ourselves narratives all the time. We tell ourselves narratives to make ourselves feel good, to help us understand the world, to help us – to console us. Um, so what are your thoughts on on that, how we should think about that as, as a modern? How should we think about tribalism, Helen? Yeah, well, I I agree absolutely with um, the idea of, of narratives. And recently, um, we both gave a talk to the University of Sydney, and we were talking. Well, I I was talking about the need to regain some narratives because postmodernism. And I'm sorry to keep returning to it. I won't keep doing that. No, you can. Uh, it's an important part of this <laughs> conversation, and it's not something we talk about on the program. And I think it's something. People who know nothing about it uh, should should get to know a little bit about it. So go ahead. 
Yeah, because it was sceptical of meta-narratives. That, that was the defining feature of it, according to Lyotard. And so we lost the grand narrative with postmodernism. And the criticisms of modernism has been that the narratives were too naive, too simplistic. Then postmodernism overcompensated. So now there's a suggestion of metamodernism which would address both of these problems and avoid the naivety um, of modernism and the cynicism and superficiality of postmodernism by restoring narratives, but also remaining slightly sceptical of them. It's, it's, it's very nuanced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like but, it. I like it. It, it, but yeah, but when you you read about metamodernism, it really seems very much like postmodernism. So yeah. what I argued for is that yes, we need to respect the human need for meta narratives, but we can make them rooted in truth and in reason, or we can have our own narratives which we can understand as having emotive or moral um, significance, but which aren't actually true. I think it's very important to sort of separate what is known to be true, even provisionally. Obviously, within science, everything is only known to be true provisionally, and what is meaningful to us. And so I, I was a little bit concerned earlier, to go back to what you said, when you said I'm a, a religious Jew, so I'm a pre-modernist, and that that is um, not at all what um, either of us meant to suggest. You know, within um, uh, this is uh, in relation to the, the tribal thing that you were talking about. James and I are both um, obviously atheists. We don't tend to take that as an identity and are quite opposed to taking that as an identity. But the idea that we don't of a common goal here with liberal, in the broadest sense, rationalist, um, religious people, Christians, Muslims, Jews, whoever, is a worry. So I would say that to be thinking, well, I'm, I'm a religious person, so therefore I'd be a pre-modernist, is, is not at all what we were suggesting. It, it just, I mentioned it because I brought it up, because it comes up Religion comes up a little bit in your essay, and it tends to fall in the pre-modern camp overwhelmingly. And I also will confess, I really like Kipling's poetry. So that's another pre-modern <laughs> aspect of my um, – of my or anti-postmodern, at least, aspect of my uh, kit bag. Um, but going back to the tribal the – tri this meta-narrative idea, I think is a really interesting idea. I think you have to concede that people like narratives. I think you have to uh, – Grind the, yeah, I think you make a very a powerful and important distinction that it's important to have different narratives for different parts of your life, some grounded in science, some don't have to be. Um, my marriage, uh, I, I idealize my marriage to some extent, I suspect, and I think that's a good thing. I don't, there's no, I don't keep data on it. I don't run any regressions, <laughs> uh, and I think that's – I encourage that. I don't think it's a good idea to scientifically analyze one's marriage or one's love, love for another person or – uh, my connection to my children or a whole variety of things. And I have a meta narrative about those that are, that's not scientific. And I think that's, I think that's really good advice. And I think, but I, when I think about getting into an airplane, I'm, I'm really focused on the scientific part of the narrative. And um, it's one of the reasons I'm not afraid to fly. So that's good. Um, but anyway, D James, do you want to add anything about narrative tribalism and what's going on there? How we ought to think well, about tribalism and the modern modern ideology? It's complicated. Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, I've I've done a lot of my last few years worth of research on on tribalism, actually, and so it's kind of an interesting topic for me. I think that what we're actually talking about, uh, in a sense, we talk about the human desire to use narratives and to cast things in stories and to understand things in ways that aren't always scientific, as you just said. And I agree with you broadly on pretty much everything you just said about your marriage and, and different aspects of life. Uh, but ultimately, um, as far as science goes, speaking as a narrative, uh, I think of science more as an inter information gathering tool. So if you needed more information, say, about your marriage or your relationship with your children, 
not necessarily science in the sense of collecting hard data and doing statistics on it, although maybe depending on the circumstances, but the scientific process of knowledge acquisition, which is to put forth ideas and ask critical questions uh, in order to find out what is as close to true as we can find out is the way that you'd want to go about it. Like I said, if you felt like there was maybe a problem or something and you needed to sort out how you can deal with that by gathering more information. So as far as tribalism and narratives go, we're talking ultimately, and I, I hesitate to use this word, but I think it's the right word, uh, or this term is human nature. We are drawn to narratives. We are also drawn to people who think like us, who share commonalities with us. Yep. We form moral groups with them at every level. Your family, for example, is a moral group. You have certain norms of behavior that are perfectly acceptable with your family that you wouldn't and I'm not saying that they're more licentious or less. It's just that you behave in a certain way with your family that you wouldn't necessarily behave with other people. And you often get to feel this, for instance, if you have two social circles that you bring into the same area and you all of a sudden realize, you know, the people from this one circle and the people from the other one are going to be a little bit awkward with each other. They don't know each other. And in particular, what you're going to find is that there's breakdowns in shared language in, uh, humor. We call these things inside jokes, for example. Yep. So we very readily form what could be called, not quite in the way Joshua Green used the word, but we very readily form what we could call moral tribes, or actually uh, the term in moral psychology is moral communities that can become tribal in nature if they get really deeply entrenched or become highly sacralized. And so because this is a fundamental part of how humans interact in the social sphere, I think that's ultimately what I was talking about when I said that classical liberalism did not fully, and even the Enlightenment, I've even wanted to call this observation the error of the Enlightenment, that, that these, these views about tribal, a human tribal behavior in the social universe are ultimately not as well addressed in classical liberalism as they need to be. So that that would be my my primary statement. It's the the fundamental reality is we are going to form tribal alliances. We're going to form them in small ways like our families and social networks. We're going to form them in big ways around ideologies or even just teams. So sports teams, if you you recently I saw a paper saying that we're actually not very good partisans uh, or that's not right. We're not very good ideologues. We are very good partisans. We form are we're very good at playing along with our team, say that the conservative team, the Republican team, the Democrats, the liberals, the libertarian, but a lot of people within the, within these groups, as is evidenced very quickly by talking to them, don't have the slightest idea what they're talking about in terms of a coherent ideology, a conservative right. ideology, so to speak. So what they're really doing is forming a tribal identification. And there are a number of ways we do that. And we don't have to get into the full details of all that, but the the important part, the takeaway here is that this is a fundamental way that human beings act socially, and therefore any political philosophy that we're going to have that's going to work optimally has to take that into account to the correct degree. And it's just a matter of finding out what those truths about human behavior are and what the right degrees are and then coming up with a system for managing them. And so to return to, to science, the, the broadly construed concept of science – that being, let's put forward ideas, let's let anybody criticize them, let's try to be careful and assume that we're wrong, and so on, and that anybody should be able to get the same results. It's not dependent on whether you're black or white or whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Muslim or whatever you happen to be. Let's put our ideas out there according to this structure, and then hopefully we will be able to, over time, converge closer and closer to whatever these truths are and strategies for working with them. Well, I love what you said. Um, my only – the nit that I would pick is that at one point you said we have to figure out how these things work and then manage them. I don't think we're very good at managing uh, these tribes in any dimension whatsoever. No. They emerge without anyone's centralized control, and different tribes rise up, different forms of identity, different forms of group of identification from sports to religion to politics, et cetera. Um, I, I can't help but mention that a, a friend of mine was recently frustrated that – she had to bring a snack to her child's uh, one of the clubs at school that her child was in, and she um, she was making the snack herself. And when asked 
uh, why she wasn't buying it. She said, well, I can't – I would normally just go to Walmart and get it, but I can't do that. She said, I can't do that, meaning if I bring a snack from Walmart to my kid's class, I'm in trouble. I will be ostracized. I will be judged. And that's a fascinating thing in 2017. It's only in certain parts of the country, obviously. Um, but it, that's a form of tribalism that we don't normally think about. Um, and it's, as you say, it's a moral tribe, a moral community uh, that, that's at work there. I want to introduce uh, someone's ideas who I, I talk about a lot on the program, which is Arnold Kling. And Arnold Kling created a taxonomy of thinking about the modern political world, which I find very helpful. And the reason I liked your taxonomies, it seems to add some things that his doesn't. So Arnold looks at, he says, basically, there's conservatives, liberals, and libertarians. Each of them look at the world through a very specific lens. The conservatives look at the world through, it's uh, the world's a fight between civilization and barbarism. And we've always got to come down to defend civilization. The liberals see the world as a war between the oppressed and the oppressor. And you always have to stand up for the oppressed. And the libertarians see the world as a fight between coercion and freedom. And I think that's generally true. Uh, at one level, I mean, it's a very powerful set of lenses, and we'll put up some links to the episode I did with Arnold's book and an essay I wrote on it. But the point is that I think I see your view as a different taxonomy, but it's related in the sense that it, it would, the way I see your view is that the pre-moderns are the conservatives who've gone – too far in their defense of civilization. The liberals are the postmoderns who've gone too far in their um, feelings for the oppressed. Um, the, the, lib the libertarians could be okay, but they've got their own issues. It's, I don't even want to think about what's wrong with the libertarians. I write about that in that in essay I'll put up, but we have our own issues. Um, but I think you're onto something different than, than what Arnold was getting at in that uh, th this – I'm just taken by your pre- and post-modern versus modern taxonomy. And I don't know, other than making that observation, I'll, I'll let you react to it and, and whether uh, you see any – how you see your work in relation to Arnold's, if, if you can, on the, on, on the spot. Helen? I, I think that's very interesting. I, I think that, yeah, in those definitions, I would fall somewhere between liberals and libertarians. And I think that this is what is important here, because when we're talking about the pre-moderns and the post-moderns, then yeah, we are talking about the authoritarians and the zealots on the extremes. So within the 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 pro moderns that we're talking about we will find plenty of conservatives plenty of liberals and plenty of libertarians i think i don't know i i I'm, i i find myself at a bit of a, a loss because of the different understanding of liberals liberalism between america and the uk quite often the the idea of, of liberalism is closer to a moderate libertarian. Yeah. Isn't? Well, let me let me let me add a different point actually, and then uh, I'll let you react, or James. I I think I think I have a better thing to say about your work and and Arnold's and how they they interface. Arnold's observation, which I think is very deep, is that liberals have trouble understanding what conservatives are talking about. Conservatives have trouble figuring out what liberals are talking about. Libertarians don't understand either one of them and vice versa. <laughs> and I think that's a deep point and it, it explains why you get into a shouting match sometimes at at a party because you just don't use the you're just using a different lens. And and I think if you absorb Arnold's viewpoint and his 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 construction of these different views, it, it to me it leads to a lot of serenity because you realize that most people aren't evil. They're just Using a different pair of glasses, they're seeing they're focusing on a different piece of the elephant, the trunk, and you're on the side of the elephant, and so you're seeing it really differently. But I see your essay actually is making a, a, a further point that I that I see now, which is it's not just that they don't understand each other; they're at war. And it's, I don't. It's obvious that liberals and conservatives are, you know disagree and spar over politics. But what I mean is that what I take as the one of the fundamental lessons of your essay 
is that the pre- and the postmoderns want to destroy modernity. It's not just, well, we don't see policy the same way you do. We want a bigger welfare state or you, we want more economic freedom or we want a bigger defense – more defense spending because we're worried about attack. You're making a, the point that the, the modernity is really at risk right now. That's the way I understand your essay. Is that is that a good, fair reading, James? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the the key word that Helen brought up was authoritarianism. So the people that we would would classify as anti modern are the ones who are whether liberal, conservative, or libertarian. Which it sounds paradoxical, but believe me, I'm surrounded by them. Uh, to say libertarians who are also authoritarian, at least self-identified. Uh, uh, it's bizarre yes. to me, but yeah, okay, I'll take that. It sounds it sounds like an oxymoron, but there are people who are so far into what they call a libertarian mindset, which is what they really mean an anti-government mindset, that they become anti-government authoritarians, and um, the the extremes here bend toward. A, toward authoritarianism. This is often captured by an idea that's called horseshoe theory. Yep. Although you need you need three legs on the horseshoe yeah, yeah. if you're going to talk <laughs> about this in terms of three political orientations, which by the way, these are backed up as three distinct moral uh, moral predilections according to moral psychology. Libertarian morality, liberal morality, and conservative morality have clear definitions that are distinct under Jonathan Haidt and Craig Joseph's concept mm. called moral foundations theory. And so um, the idea with horseshoe theory ultimately is that up on the backside, I'm sorry, I don't know the parts of a horseshoe anymore. I looked it up at one point. I can't remember what they're called. But on the rounded backside of the horseshoe, you are bending toward a construction toward liberty, individual liberty in particular. And then on the ends of the horseshoe down at, down at the feet of it, right, maybe that's what they're called. Um, we're bending toward social authoritarian, uh, social authoritarianism. In, in fact, the main dimension that these people are engaged in is what's called authoritarian conventionalism. They believe that their views should be conventional within their own group and conventional to everybody else. That's the technical term under Bob Altemeyer's construction of authoritarianism. And that's the ultimate war is that we now have – because of what we called in the essay existential polarization, where each side sees the others as a true, complete threat to our current social order or even way of life or even an existential threat to humanity by causing its collapse. We have people that have gone so far down their respective paths and have become so rigid in that their prescription is the one true way to solve all of humanity's problems that they've become violently authoritarian. Incidentally, they don't like each other at all and argue incessantly amongst each other. And then this creates even more drama, almost like a superpower. We did call it a superpower in the in the essay, saying that these people have this ability to take people that are somewhere near the middle, the so-called center, and skew them to one side or another out of abject fear that the world is going to end, the sky is falling because of the, those people over there, whether it be the libertarians or whether it be the liberals or whether it be the conservatives. And so um, that, I think, is ultimately the dimension that we're, we're really concerned with. So I don't disagree with, with the taxonomy you said Krang gave. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. Klang, sorry. No. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, in fact, I think it's quite profound as well, uh, and I think he's really onto something. Um, on the other hand, I think that our ultimate struggle right now for modernity, which is under threat, is that it's under threat from – people who have become very authoritarian in their worldviews, which has been increasing uh, in recent years, recent decades, because of this growing sense of polarization that I believe has now become existential polarization. So let's talk about that for a minute. Helen, do you have a thought on the – why Why it feels that way? And maybe that's just because we're spending too much time on Twitter, uh, which I know <laughs> I am, and I think you've, you've semi-confessed you are. Do you really think that the world's more polarized right now. This self-righteous, this self-righteous fringe of each side of the horseshoe, the left and the right. Let's leave the libertarians out for the moment. Um, but just the the postmodern left is certainly has an authoritarian bent. The pre-modern right certainly has an authoritarian bent. Are they just are they just louder than and more audible than before? Are they really is it a, really a serious threat? 
It it is a serious. Feels threat. like it is. I have to confess, I'm worried about it, but it, <laughs> I wonder. It's a serious threat because people believe it's a serious threat, and that is part of what we were trying to say in the manifesto: is to get people to realise just how fringe these ideas are. Because what tends to happen is that like moderate right wingers will see the extremes of the left and become convinced that this represents the left and that the whole of the left has to be opposed drastically. This is the ex existential threat and the moderate left will do the same to the right and they will see the, the alt right or the far right as defining the right. And so, you know, when they're talking on social media or when we're, we're, we're reading um, sort of analyses of politics, then we will hear the left does this and the right does that. And if you saw, we, we had a little um, graphic in our, um, in our essay, which just sort of demonstrated that these are the fringes and most of the people in the middle in this graphic are saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. Except that because of the existential the perception of this existential threat right now, people are internalising the, the most faulty narratives of their own side in order to defend against what they see as the, the existentially dangerous threats on the other side. Yeah, when you, so, point out, when you point out to them that – and many of these people are not on the fringe of intellectual life. They're just on the fringe of the political spectrum. They're at the centre of intellectual life often. And you point out to them, and boy, you're awfully overconfident. They say, well, we have to be. The world's going, we're going, we're going to be, we have to stand up to the evil. And they never imagine the possibility that they could be part of the problem or that the evil that they're worried about maybe isn't so evil. Well, th this is what we are essentially trying to say to people is if you're a leftist and you're worried by what's going on, your natural ally might not be the far left. It might be the moderate rightists. And so we wanted to try and, and refigure the way that people were were thinking and the way that the polarization was growing by reframing it not as left versus right, but as the defenders of of modernity against the anti modernists who are essentially the same. They don't present exactly the same problems to society, obviously, but their their thinking and their threat is very much the same. So if we can get people to sort of step down from the polarization by seeing that they actually have a great many more allies on within the spectrum, if they can stop seeing it in this very sort of left-right polarized terms. Yeah. Uh, James, you in the essay, you write that – I'm going to step back here for a second and, and recover some of this ground because I think it's um, – it's, again, very novel. You write, partisanship is modernity's weakness. Why, why should that be? And what do you mean by that? We have this problem where modernity itself, as you indicated, is, going to, or is always going to spin off. When you give people individual liberty to pursue their own values, uh, it's always going to spin off competing groups. And those competing groups are able often to form Partisan, or form tribes, and at the grandest scale, we're going to end up with a two or three part, and in, in the American system, usually a two part system in which it's one side versus the other. And libertarians often see themselves as somewhat distinct from conservatives, but I'll tell you that liberals do not see libertarians in the United States as distinct from conservatives. Like Helen said, that uh, Americans are often confused by the idea that there's a libertarian left in the uk uh, so often and the reasons are i mean quite straightforward based out of our voting systems and all of this and we could get into that whole thing uh, divergers law about voting and it's all political theory uh talking about why we end up with a two-party system and if you try to break a big coalition you become politically weaker than the other side so it's not really that great of an idea to do it too often uh, so, for instance, if the libertarians were to fully split off from the conservatives, conservative politics would get crushed by the Democrats until somehow one or the other became strong enough to become the new conservative party. So we often end up with this partisanship that then leads to team playing, which leads to people no longer thinking about the issues in any level of depth. 
not that they've really, you know, historically done so, not to say that we're, I don't want to hearken back to some lost age of, of enlightenment where the common man was deeply invested in political thought because that typically wasn't the case. <laughs> that would be completely ahistorical yeah. to, to claim that. But the invitation to join a team and just ride, you know, to, to just party line vote, for instance, just go down and say, well, I don't care who, who's on the Republican ticket. Cause I vote, I don't care what they stand for, or what they say. I don't care what's going on. I vote Democrat period. Uh, it, it's a very, very scary temptation. And it's ultimately the weakness. And I say of modernity, but in, in, in this aspect, I actually mean of democracy as a part of yeah. modernity. Yeah. So, we hope for the best by having divided powers, which help tremendously, and by having in the United States so many different districts, many of the states that have certain degrees of power, both in the House and in the Senate and so on. And we kind of hope for the best. But there are there are real challenges that come up. And obviously one of the biggest challenges is the inability to speak across these partisan divides and then the invitation under certain societal stresses – to become more and more existentially polarized where you feel like the conservatives are ruining the world or the liberals are trying to destroy Western civilization, which are both things that I hear routinely in the circles that I run in. And we may get emails to this episode, comments and, and emails and tweets that say, but they are, whichever side they're on. Oh, yeah. sh- I, I wouldn't <laughs> be the least bit surprised. That may um, be the bulk of the emails. Yeah. Uh, Helen, why do you think um – this partisanship has increased. Why do you think the center isn't holding the way it maybe it did in the past? I think, well, obviously I'm thinking more from a European perspective, but I've found um, uh, that Jonathan Haidt recently wrote, well, a couple, maybe a year ago now, wrote a wonderful essay saying when um, nationalism beats globalism. Uh-huh. And from our perspective over here, there is a greater sense of existential threat due to the refugee crisis. Yep. And at the same time, our left has essentially, in the UK anyway, has has essentially disintegrated, leading to a surge to the right. So I think that, I mean, Jonathan Haidt, what he spoke about was an authoritarian button that gets pressed when... Um, where when we have a sense of an existential threat, yep. and this has caused um, moderate conservatives and even centrists to suddenly become much more nationalistic, even to the point of xenophobia, because of the refugee crisis. And then, in reaction to that, the left, who have just dismally failed to address um, genuine concerns about it, have just sort of doubled down and responded to the 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 surge to the right and the the sort of populist nationalism with accusations of bigotry and it just sort of it just sort of escalates from here with the people getting further and further away from understanding each other and um, the, the problem that's actually in play and I, I think to a certain extent, but you two will know better about this, that this is also happening in America, but with sort of different, quite yeah. different dynamics. Yeah, it is happening in America, and it is it's just different, slightly different issues, but it's it's not, they're not unrelated. It's it's a, it's partly just, it's you could call it a fight for the, quote, soul of the nation, what kind of a country mm-hmm. we want to be, should be, think we were. But I want to, James, I'm going to let you comment um, on you can either agree or extend or disagree with what Helen said, but I want to toss in the the phenomenon of social media, which I find a temptation to blame for a lot of this. And I don't know if that's – it seems a little bit too simplistic for me. I'm a little bit worried about it, but it might be true. So what are your comments on that? So broadly, I agree with what Helen said. Um, I think in the – in the U.S. at least, there's also been a dynamic that's driven polarization where I don't know and don't want to try to figure out at the moment and don't want to point fingers how this um, almost he said, she said spiraling anger began. But sometime in what appears to me to be roughly the 1990s, late 1980s, possibly, there seems to have been this 
increasing dynamic in the media sphere to fragment into right-wing media and left-wing media and for each side to essentially blame the other, they then, and this will tie into social media also, they then seem to have engaged, or this seems to have been a very popular form of engagement with this partisan media environment. And maybe that just arose because of the accessibility of cable and and radio bandwidth and all of that becoming easier as technology progressed through the, through the 80s and 90s, I think. That's the first but step. At any rate, yeah, at, at any rate, it became very, very fashionable because it, it, we would call it clickbait now or uh, outrage farming or something like that. It's become very fashionable to go find the most extreme lunatic on the other side from your own and then present them as if they are typical in order to fear monger or to whip up a base or to radicalize. And this works. Um, this has been, you know, I know that for instance, Fox news got accused of it uh, several years ago of looking for, you know, the most lunatic liberal they could find or to put a guy up there in the most, you know, bizarre, you know, stereotypically uh, maybe almost hippie outfit or something and to say something crazy and then be like, well, there you go, audience. You know, this is what the liberals look like and think. And this was this is a form of not exactly journalism that I think has driven a lot of, of polarization because from what I understand, one of the stronger effects on social media in particular that drives polarization is this weird combination that it, it facilitates, just like the cable news facilitates, that you can sort of find yourself in a bubble where you can present views that are very likely to go unchallenged. And then if you really want to get people worked up and to support your cause, you can then throw out something that causes a lot of cognitive dissonance and trigger the so-called backfire effect. Um, from what I understand, this is hypothesized to be one of the strongest drivers of polarization rising out of social media. It's not that you go on your social media and you've carefully manicured it so that it's, you know, say liberal, 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 liberal. Oh, I agree. I agree. I agree. And everything's just la la land, you know, liberal bubble. And so you get skewed from reality. It's that most of your experience is that. So you feel like this is a very popular or common or everybody kind of right side of history opinion. And then all of a sudden, you know, the 10th post or sixth post in your feed, your feed is this person saying something from the other side. Either it's somebody uh, on your team, so to speak, repeating it to outraged effect to mock it or it's yeah. your or it happens to be your crazy uncle that you have to be friends with who's put some, you know, idiot view from your perspective. And so you, you see this, oh, the whole world thinks kind of like I do. And then the other side says this absolutely radical stuff. So we've got to fight. And this effect seems to be one of the primary drivers of polarization that rises out of social media. So whether social media is, is a huge driver of this or not, I think is unclear. But I share your suspicion that it is. And I would guess that what I've just described is something close to its mechanism of action. I know that it's how I'm most likely to become just being self-reflective, to become kind of radicalized angry. and motivated for us. <laughs> angry, yeah, outraged. Yeah. Oh, look what these idiots on yeah. the far – I mean, even it's possible that this is why I have such a view against these so-called anti-modern people. I see them on left and right all day long, and it's like, ah, come on. And I'm, i got to say something about these people. And so I have a feeling that that may be kind of what we're all feeling because I think the feeling is much more common than just the three of us. Uh, I feel like that this is a, this is possibly the dynamic that plays in on social media, but also it played on increasingly partisan cable news programming and the blending of, of you know news and opinion that has kind of dominated journalism for the past couple of decades because it sells. Yeah, no, it's um, it's the dark side of capitalism for a capitalist like me. I think the the media marketplace is designed to make people angry, uh, not to inform them. And we still have an illusion. It's it's dying, by the way. I think this illusion, but we have an illusion that there's there's things called journalism and and reporting and investigative reporting. Of course, there still is some, but it's dying. And Fox News is an example of of that uh, death for sure. Um, uh, my parents, who watch it religiously, have a strange view of data. <laughs> of you know what's true about the world. They've been scared. They're in their eighties. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's true of people who watch CNN. I know it's – I don't watch much – I don't watch cable. I get my cable from my parents. But I do, I do get the New York Times, and the New York Times has been doing this for the longest time. And it also – on the other side. And it goes back to the, the morning talk shows where people will, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they deliberately pick unpleasant representatives of the, quote, other side to make them look foolish or dangerous – because it, it creates more entertainment. And we have this illusion that news is for making us citizen, better citizens. It, to me, it's just a form, it's just a different form of, of NFL football with a smaller chance of concussion, but an equal chance or more of brain damage of a different kind. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's a very uh, – and I, and I think social media is just the, the new, the latest extreme. Uh, we, we've got a little time left. So what's to be done? You spent some time in the essay on that. W what do you advocate – um, you don't have to have a solution, of course. Could just be we got to watch it play out, and we, no one can, of course, do anything about it. But you know, we had um, Megan McArdle on here recently talking about the internet shaming phenomenon, and I wrote a essay res in response to that phenomenon to some extent, but also just to this general this polarization issue. Uh, and you know, there's some obvious things like be civil. You know, we, Megan and I talked about that. But I'm curious what what you see as the as a possible road to a healthier discourse and a uh, less less outrage and anger. Helen, why don't you go first? I mean, I, I, I tend to think that, I mean, well, in, in the manifesto, we spoke about the attempt not to polarize, to meet against, meet across the divide. And I think, you know, in, in, I, I understand certainly the problem with social media, that it is an aggravating factor for the problems that we're having at the moment. But what it's aggravating is our own flawed thinking and our own ever increasing sort of tribalism. So I think that the way forward is for those of us um, who who are concerned about the extremes to try and expand our own circles to expand what we can and can't tolerate so that the people on the moderate left can have some alliances with the people on the moderate right because we've seen a, a narrowing of a, a real sort of demand for for purity i was i was arguing with the alt right earlier today where uh, people were well, women. A woman was being accused of being a feminist, and a man of being Jewish, because they disagreed. And we see this on the left as well, where there is a purity. You haven't used the right terminology for um, this sort of trans identity. And I think we have to try and reverse that. And we can do that on the level of the individual. On if each person can try to see where their borders are and try to expand them, try to expand their minds a bit. And the, the the sort of range of people and the range of ideas that they're willing to accept. And when we're talking to each other as well, if we can take responsibility for our own mistakes, if we find that we have been wrong, if we can say, I, I was wrong about that, thank you, that was helpful. Just anything we can do to try to reduce the the, the, the polarization and the categorization that we're having at the moment, and if we can get more more charismatic people to be more accessible, I mean, this was um, Matthew Dancona's book, which I, I recently read, and he was um, about the post truth society, and he was talking about the way to get um, to, to get people united in favour of of truth and, and reason. And he was talking about actually getting more onto social media, getting the charismatic scientists, the rationists, the experts to be more accessible, not to spurn sort of public uh, social media or, or any kind of public engagement and retreat to their sort of ivory towers, but to get out there more, be more accessible, talk to people of different kinds and just try to make more alliances, try to re-establish the expectation that you will, that conversation will be civil, it will be reasonable and it will, it will include evidence and argument. And we can all do a little bit of that. Here, here. James, you want to close this out? 
Sure. Um, I think uh, to say two things, I think that the first is that uh, while we should be broadening our circles, we should also be learning to ignore people <laughs> and to develop the skill to detect when somebody's being an extremist. When somebody say, as Helen pointed out, is saying, oh, well, you used the wrong categor categorization for trans people or whatever. Therefore, you're this terrible transphobe, sexist, whatever it happens to be, you know, they're going to come up with a million epithets. That person should be seen as essentially excluding themselves from the adult table. They are sitting at the kid's table. We don't have to engage with them. I use the mute button very liberally for such people on Twitter. I don't hesitate. Oh, look at this. They decided to fling epithets. Muted. I'll never hear from them again. I'm not going to go review that. I'm, I just, I have thousands of people I've muted. I'm not going to look through and figure out who needs to be unmuted. So learning to ignore people is actually going to be a crucial part rather than saying you're feeling this need to promote those people's views by saying, Hey, look how wrong this person. I'm sorry. Look how wrong this person is and then promote it by retweeting it or quote tweeting it or screenshotting it or trying to generate outrage with it. There's a, a fine line between making a point from it and then promoting it in order to garner tribal outrage. And I think that learning to quell the instinct to promote that kind of stuff and just to ignore the extremists because they aren't bringing themselves legitimately to the table of, of knowledge pursuit is, is a first step. Uh, second step would be to, as Helen indicated, to form these kind of alliances, friendships even. My, my dad actually had a really interesting view he shared with me when I was a teenager about politics. I never knew growing up whether my dad was conservative, liberal, or libertarian. I had no idea. In fact, I don't plainly know now. Um, he's done quite the good job of, of hiding it or actually maybe has a nuanced view, but that's the one I'm going to advocate for. What he told me when I was a kid was to realize that the uh, various political positions are like the parts of a car. The liberal side to highly um, oversimplify is like the gas pedal. The conservative side is like the brake pedal. And you need the libertarians, I guess, to extend his analogy because he didn't include them, uh, are kind of like the steering wheel to keep you in your lane, uh, the lane of, of, you know, liberty. Do you need all of those parts for the car to operate correctly? And so rather than seeing conservatives as being this horrible group or the liberals as being out to destroy society or libertarians as being pie in the sky idealists. You can see their contributions as being part of, part of, as you said, like the elephant, part of a bigger truth. And not only that, but as integral parts to figuring out the problem we're all interested in, which is the problem of society itself. Um, so, you know, it's, easier for me, for instance, to stomach something that seems a little bit too conservative for my taste to remember that this is a person just advocating that maybe we need to put on the brakes as a society a little bit. And then I can consider that. And I, I would encourage people to think that way. You know, what value is there here? Is it possible that we need to put the brakes on some of this? On the other side, liberals, maybe we need to step on the gas a little bit. Maybe we need to get somewhere a little further along the road and, and so on and so forth. So I think that learning to see each side, whether it's liberal, conservative or libertarian to draw, to draw this trichotomy as trying to contribute something valuable that encourages both humility and uh, open mindedness. And I think that those factors will allow people to become a little bit more um a little bit more willing to make friends and alliances and to hear people out and to consider and then to engage in this liberal knowledge production strategy where we put things out there and debate them and try to retain the merits rather than, you know, diving into our own camps and saying everybody else is just dead wrong. My guests today have been Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Their essay is A Manifesto Against the Enemies of Modernity. Helen and James, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. And thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.